We're happy to have you join us on this warm summer evening to talk about bees and to have a happy discussion about the bees that are thriving in Detroit and to understand more why Detroit is the place to be. On our panel tonight, we have Timothy Jackson and Nicole Lindsay from Detroit Hive. So they'll be talking to you about their programs. Sarah Scott from The Ohio State University will be giving you an overview about um, a lot of the different bees that are found in urban spaces. Um, I'm Megan Milbreath. I work at Michigan State University in research and extension on honeybees and other pollinators. And I'll be just giving you an overview of the MSU resources. And then Dr. Kelsey Graham, who's a postdoc in the entomology department at Michigan State University, will be giving you a talk on wool carter bees. Anna Heck is also available tonight, or she's here tonight, um, to cover for me when my internet goes out or if it goes out. And she is our brand new extension educator on bees and pollinators at MSU. Um, so I'm just going to show a couple of resources. We do have this beekeeping webinar resource. So even though this isn't going to be all beekeeping, it'll still be on this place. You can find it by Googling MSU beekeeping web, um, webinars, and it'll be available on YouTube as well later. So this is how you would navigate it. Everything that we do goes to the website pollinators.msu.edu, um, so which is the Michigan Pollinator Initiative. And you can see if you go to beekeepers, the apiculture extension webinars show up. Um, but this is another thing that's available. So again, going to pollinators.msu.edu. Um, we're not necessarily going to be talking all about beekeeping tonight. And so a lot of people are probably going to be interested in a couple other things on the site. Um, and I don't have a full long example that we sometimes do. So take time to navigate through it. Um, the pollinator planting one, I think will be of interest to a lot of people. And that covers everything from planting a small garden to planting large scale things for paint. Um, there's a whole list of, of trees that are really useful for pollinators as well. We have a native bee section that highlights the native bees in Michigan and shows how you can provide, provide housing for them. Um, and then up in the upper left hand corner, we have a help the bees and that shows you a variety of ways that you can help pollinators, including policy things or how you could be a good advocate and citizen science projects. We also um, take a lot of questions from the public. And so I mentioned we do have an extension educator, but we have this system called um, ask an expert, which is at extension.org. You can also find it on our website if you go to, um, there's a part at the top where it says questions and that'll take you there. So if after this you wanna ask questions about bees or wanna find resources or wanna get involved or and literally just have a beekeeping question or how to plant for pollinator question, you can submit it through this. They'll send it to someone in Michigan or an expert on the topic and we'll get back to you quickly. Um, so it's a really efficient way that extension can handle lots of questions about bees and pollinators. I mean, anything else too. Um, we are getting better at putting stuff out on social media. So we have Facebook pages for our different programs for MSU Honeybees, for the Pollinator Initiative, which is goes beyond honeybees, for our Here's to Highest program, which is our honey beekeeping program for um, veterans as well. So you can find us on Facebook at all of these places. We manage a lot of hives throughout the state. So for those of you who are beekeepers, I have two slides specifically on that. Um, we have the Michigan Sentinel Apiary. So normally we keep bees. We don't have them at the new Detroit Extension Center yet. Um, we were gonna get an update on that tonight, but we don't have that available. But we do have bees in Novi. So there's some that are at least getting the climate of Southeast Michigan. Um, they aren't there this year because of pandemic reasons, but we hope to have them back for next year. But we, what we do with this project is we follow these colonies. We provide updates on how the health of them, on different management strategies that we're doing. So um, beekeepers that are trying to like work out some of their timing or see how things work around the state can get information about their hives. We also monitor diseases in those as well. And then again, for beekeepers, we are just finishing up Mitathon. Um, this is by far the most important year to, or most important time of the year to make sure that your pests are under control. This is like the key time that we lose lots of honeybee colonies or that the 
not that we lose them, is that they start towards their death because of overwhelming parasite loads. Um, and so we're just really asking people to go out and monitor their hives. And that's important for your honeybee health, but then it's also really important for us to collect data. Um, so there's this program called Mitothon. It's a national program and it ends on the 30th. So go out this weekend, monitor your hives, and then go to mitecheck.com or you can do it through the MiteCheck app and report what you find. And that's really, really useful for us to get a sense of what's going on and for you to just make sure that you're in good shape before winter. All right, and the last slide that I wanna um, highlight is our Pollinator Champions Program. So this is a free online course. Uh, if you guys haven't had enough computer time in the era of COVID and you want something else to do, or if you've got kids or other people who would be interested, we tried to make it about like a six to 10 hour course. And again, it's completely free. It's completely self-paced. So you work through it as you want to work through it. And it covers who the pollinators are in Michigan, why this issue is so important and why we care about them, the things that are happening to them, and then ways that you can help. Um, if you want to go on to be a certified pollinator champion, you can pay a small fee that allows you to have access to a PowerPoint slide set and then you can go on and give um, educational talks to other people. So we're really proud of this program. It's reached a lot of people. It really helps us extend at least the basic information um, out to others about pollinators. So if you're interested in either just taking the course for yourself or if you're interested in becoming a champion so that you can go out and share that information with others, um, we hope that you check it out. All right, so that's the last I have. Um, I'm gonna turn over the slide sharing to Detroit Hive. Awesome. Hello. Hey everyone, how's everyone doing? Good, good, good. So right now we're about to get ready to share our screen for our presentation. But before we do that, once again, just want to do another introduction. My name is Timothy. My name is Nicole. And we're the co-founders of this was co-executive directors for Detroit Hives. Then we formed Detroit Hives in 2017. And fast forward, we've grown into a wonderful organization serving our community and our pollinators. So without further ado, we can start with our presentation. So once again, Detroit Hives is a 501c3 nonprofit organization co-founded by me and as well as my partner, Nicole. Um, we're, two, we're two native Detroiters with a vision to create sustainable communities and bee populations by reimagining the vacant landscape into educational apiaries. An apiary is just a big fancy word for bee farm or bee yard, a place where you uh, particularly keep honeybees paired with wildflowers or a garden. We also work to create pollinator friendly spaces to support our native bees and pollinators as well. Here at Detroit House, we do believe a healthy future for bees reflects a healthy future for humanity. The health of those in our inner cities, specifically people of color, is sometimes often last to be considered. From bacon lots into urban bee farms, we revitalize neighborhoods. We're at Detroit Hives, a honeybee education and conservation initiative that engages urban communities in our mission by creating cultural experiences that are both educational and relatable. So we started our project in May 23rd of 2017 with our first vacant lot located on the East Warren Apiary with three hives. Since then, we've expanded to 13 locations that make way of a vacant lots that we purchased in the city of Detroit, local schools, and community organizations. And we're managing 45 beehives right here in the city of Detroit. But our project is more than just putting hives in vacant lots or putting them on to support the conservation. Here at Detroit Hives, we do believe in a 3P model. We have adopted a 3P model. And our focus areas is education, conservation, and community development. And the 3P model comes into where we support pollinators, people, and our planet. So starting with our first project, the East Warren Apiary, and the picture seen above, that's the before shot of the, of the vacant lot. And down below, is, of course, is the, the after shot. And what we're able to do is not only transform this vacant space, but make it an inviting space for not only pollinators, but people. Yeah, so we've been transforming uh, vacant lots and transforming lives. Absolutely. And one great thing about transforming 
vacant spaces that were once blighted that it can help reverse mental depression, but also give you a sense of pride of your community. Also, one great thing about this vacant space is not turns from, that's transformed into an educational apiary. It's an inviting space for local residents to learn about uh, pollinators, to learn about honeybees. Particularly in this photo, we have a resident named Jamar Braggs, who is very interested in what we're doing. And he just has some simple questions in this particular hive inspection. We warned this gentleman to probably stay at a safe distance because we're, we're, we're inspecting this hive. But Jamar Braggs out from the east side. I've seen a little bit of everything, and the bee won't hurt me. And, he, and, and one thing we're learning is that there's a lot of people in our community that really have an interest in pollination, they have an interest in growing their own food, and have an interest in local raw honey. And this project serves that need. Um, another way that we engage our community is through bee music. We had an event where we had invited the community to come out to our bee farm to engage in an unusual way what we wanted to do was create a space for a, our drama Ife vest and for our bees. More so an experience. Yeah. Once again, it's an inclusive space, not just for pollinators, but also for people. So how do you create a space that's welcoming for all living things? Yep. So we wanted to show how people can come together with humans and insects. Absolutely. <laughs> Another great way is through civic engagement. The East Warren Apiary that was once a vacant lot now serves as a place where not only community residents, local businesses, but also students traveling and studying abroad can come and partake in volunteer projects. We've had schools from Duke University, um, also, oh, I thought I had another slide. Yeah, schools from Duke University, but also from uh, UConn. Other, UConn, Penn State, Wayne State University as well come out to partake and volunteer at the East Warren Apiary. So moving forward, I want to talk about some of our upcoming or current projects that we're currently working on. So our first one is the Motor City Garden. Detroit has been dubbed the Motor City for over 100 years. It's been a true leader in today's industries, uh, leading the market in the automotive industry and many other uh, industries. But Detroit can be many other things besides the Motor City. With our, with our efforts with uh, passing a resolution with city council on making Detroit a B city, we want to say how do we tie the two, initi two initiatives together? Detroit being the motor city, but also our efforts on making Detroit a B city. We had an aha moment where we wanted to create the Motor City Garden. And what the Motor City Garden is, it's a project where we're transforming a once vacant lot, but also upcycling an abandoned 1981 Ozenville Cutlass to serve as a living partner and habitat where the car itself will serve, as a, will serve as a raised garden filled with native wildflowers attracting native bees and pollinators. On this project, we are working with Team GM Cares. Team GM Cares has already removed all the internal parts of this car. And what's really cool about it is that the grill will serve, the empty part of the grill will serve as a native bee home to attract native bees to, to also provide local, local food for the, the pollinators as well. And here's a photo render of what this project is expected to look like. Due to COVID, we had to put this project back to next year for spring 2021. But this is just a photo render of our current project scheduled for next year. Moving forward, we're working on completing a perennial propagator. Um, we're very grateful and thankful to be a recipient of the Detroit Future City uh, Organization that has awarded us a grant to transform this vacant lot into a perennial propagator. This vacant lot will home, will house and be home to over 200 native plants, actually over 300 native plants, attracting native bees and pollinators as well. And here is a full list of of what to expect for this particular project. Lastly, we welcome everyone to join the hive. For this particular project with the perennial propagator, we are looking for volunteers. So if you're an avid gardener, if you love to give back, if you love to uh, plant flowers, we're looking for those that want to be a part of this project. And one way you can definitely sign up to volunteer is to send us an email at info at DetroitHives.org or visit us at DetroitHives.org website. At this moment, we're going to stop sharing our screen and pass it right back to Megan. Thank you so much, guys. That was 
inspiring and I'm awed by how much you guys do. Um, so that was a, a lovely overview of your projects. And Sarah, if you want to go ahead and share your screen and talk about all the bees that are going to be eating off of all the delicious food that Timothy and Nicole are putting out there. Uh, hello. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so my name is Sarah Scott, um, and I'm a graduate student at uh, the Ohio State University in Dr. Mary Gardner's lab. Um, so today I'll be talking about the different species that you can find commonly in cities. Um, our lab looks at uh, specifically lots in the Cleveland area and who's there and how urban life impacts their fitness. So a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, first I'll touch on cities as habitat for bees and the different shapes that that can take. Um, I'll then talk briefly about the diversity of bees and which ones you can commonly find in cities and uh, we'll end with what you can do to encourage more bees to move into your neighborhood. So cities have been receiving a lot of attention recently about their benefits towards pollinators and other beneficial species. There's a wide range of green space types within cities, ranging from highly manicured gardens to unmanaged lots, uh, to now I see cars, which is such a cool project. Uh, green spaces within cities oftentimes have a high plant diversity too, either through planned garden plantings or spontaneous vegetation. These habitats vary in their conservation value to different beneficial species. So there's a wide variety of shapes and sizes that these habitats can take within cities. So organic urban agriculture is a fantastic way to provide food to these different uh, pollinators and other beneficial species, as well as just weeds and spontaneous vegetation that grows in unmanaged areas. So studies that have found that there's a really high diversity of bees in both urban farms and vineyard moss systems in cities across the country and across the world. So worldwide, there are about 20,000 different species of bees. Here in North America, we've got about 4,000 species. And in Michigan, you'll see about 450 different species of bees. And many of those can actually be found uh, in and around foraging in your gardens and other nearby green spaces. So a bit about these different types of bees. So a majority of bees are solitary, meaning that there's one egg laying female per nest. They construct and provision their nests without the help of any other members of the same species. About 90% of bees that live in North America, about 3,600 species are solitary, making up the other 10% or so of bees um, are the social bees. So these include the bumblebees and honeybees that we all know and love. Um, these bees are social and have at least two adult females living in one nest that share the work of both provisioning and preparing and protecting the nest. So bees have a large range of nesting behaviors. Most bees are soil and cavity nesters. Uh, we call, like to call those miners and renters. Uh, about 30% of bees nest in hollow twigs in plant stems or other pre-existing cavities such as old beetle burrows or other tunnels and holes that you find in trees. The remaining 70% of bees nest in the ground. There's a few outliers uh, that nest in unique locations as well. So for example, carpenter bees will chew nests into wooden structures um, such as trim or benches or your house if you're unlucky. Um, though, but the wide diversity of nesting preferences from soil to stem creates a unique opportunities for a wide range of bees to live within complex habitats such as cities. So which bees do live in cities? The majority of bee species that live in urban areas are predominantly miners. Those are the soil ground nesting bees. However, renters, the bees that live in the pre-existing holes, are the most abundant group of bees that we've found in cities. This could be due to an abundance of human-provided nesting structures that are now available in these areas. Um, anecdotally, our lab has actually found renter bees uh, nesting in fake flowers that people decorate their homes with. Uh, so carpenter bees are also opportunistic and live in human-made structures uh, that are common in urban areas. So I'll briefly go over a few of the main groups of bees. Uh, so mining and sweat bees are both ground nesting bees um, and can commonly be found within cities. Andrina or mining bees prefer to nest in sandy soils near or under shrubs so they're protected from the heat and frost. They're easily recognizable by the presence of a broad velvety area on their forehead between their eyes and antennas. Helictidae uh, or the sweat bees are usually dark colored and metallic in appearance. These are beautifully colored bees. Uh, several species are either all or partially green. A couple are red, some have some yellow markings. Um, they're all really gentle and rarely sting. 
So squash bees are pollen specialists on the cucurbit plant uh, family, feeding on species such as squash and gourds and other closely related plants. Um, although they usually don't visit watermelons and cucumbers and other melon plants. Female squash bees will nest in the ground. Um, however, the male squash bees oftentimes actually will spend their nights sleeping in squash blossoms, um, which they'll go in before the, the blossom closes for the day. They are also soil nesters who will build their nests at the base of the plant. So that makes them uh, really susceptible to disturbance by tilling and uh, messing with the soils. Leaf cutter and mason bees are renter bees that live in pre-existing cavities. Their common name reflects what each species makes their nest out of, leaves or soil. So megachylid bees carry their pollen on the undersides of their abdomen as opposed to on their legs or other parts of their bodies that you commonly see with honeybees and bumblebees and um, other, other bees as well. They use their large mandibles to cut leaf fragments from plants to line their nests with. Um, and, but fortunately, um, this is only superficial damage to the plants. Um, it doesn't actually do any harm to them past removing the leaf. Like most solitary bees, they provision individual cells that they construct with a pollen ball and lay a single egg on top. Then they cap that cell and repeat the process over again. Mason bees have the same process, but they just use mud instead. So some bees branch out from using only leaves to incorporate flower petals into their nests as well. This species isn't actually native to the US, but I just really wanted to share it because it's really cute. Um, they're found in, in Turkey and Iran. So carpenter bees live in wooden structures. They're both uh, large and small carpenter bee species. Small carpenter bees uh, live in the center of stems that have pithy centers, um, sun such as sunflowers, different shrubs, sumac, uh, blackberry, etc. So, but unfortunately, the, the stems actually need to be broken for them to gain access. Large carpenter bees can actively chew their cavity into wooden structures, such as fences, railings, um, or garden sheds to construct their nests. These bees are oftentimes confused with bumblebees, um, but can easily be told apart because carpenter bees have a shiny abdomen, whereas bumblebees do not. These are extremely large bees, but they are very gentle. The bees that you typically see patrolling around an area are actually the males. Um, you'll see a little yellow patch on their forehead, uh, but they're all bark and no bite. Male bees um, of any species actually don't have a sting, so they are not able to, to hurt you. So mobile bees are not social bees, um, but I had to include them because this is the species that I work with and they're just really fascinating bees. Um, so these are large bodied bees that are able to fly really far distances uh, compared to other species to forage for food. They nest in pre-existing spaces such as old rodent, rodent burrows, um, dense brush in piles of cinder blocks and tool sheds. <coughs> um, their colony sizes range, <coughs> excuse me, um, between 30 and 300 individuals depending on the different on the species that you're looking at. Um, and they have an annual colony life cycle, meaning that the colony will produce males and queens in the autumn. Those queens will then leave their colony and mate, and they go and find an area in the ground to overwinter and wait until the spring, when then she'll start her own colony. Um, and so bumblebees actually have a pretty neat way of foraging for pollen. They perform buds pollination. Um, so they vibrate their wings at a specific frequency after uh, biting down on the flower, um, and this unlocks and releases more pollen from that plant than normal foraging does alone. So the vibration is about 313 hertz, um, which fun fact is actually uh, the same frequency as certain electric toothbrushes, or you can get tuning forks in the same frequency um, and actually buzz pollinate a plant yourself as well. Um, so a handful of plant species are pollinated this way, including um, cranberries, tomatoes, and potatoes. So if you like all of these bees and want more in your yard, uh, there's a few simple things that you can do to attract them to your, to your area. All bees, like all living things, need food, water, and shelter. So you can attract bees to your yard by providing a few, uh, each of these different resources. So food is really important and that uh, flowers are bees' only source of food. And shelter um, is also very important for providing spaces for the bees to, to nest. So a bit, in a bit more detail, so flowers are bee food. Um, when planting your garden, be sure to plant a diversity of plant species that are native to your area. Try to plan to have at least three different species of flowers blooming at any one time throughout the entire growing season. If you can't, that's no problem. Any amount of flowers help. 
Also, the more the merrier. Uh, pl try to plant an abundance of each type of flower so they're easier for the bees to find and also have more resources closer together for the bees. Every little bit helps. And flowers are flowers no matter what kind. So don't forget about flowering trees and shrubs. These are really important early season forage for bees that provide the kick of energy that they need after coming out from overwintering. And when looking up what flowers to plant, make sure you use credible sources. The Xerxes Society has regional plant lists you can use, as do university extensions such as uh, Michigan State's fantastic website. Um, so if you, it, also if you don't have a yard or place that you can plant flowers, container gardeners uh, are lovely as well. And don't forget the weeds. So dandelions are fantastic early season resources for bees, as are other spontaneous vegetation. So simply waiting a few days longer to mow your lawn or weed your garden provides valuable re food for bees. Uh, so adding nesting places will also encourage bees to move in. As with providing food for bees, you can actively add shelter or alternatively do less to do more. And what, do I, what I mean by that is to leave some bare patches of ground um, undisturbed. So don't, don't till it or do anything with that. Um, preferably south facing, leave patches of soils undisturbed for ground nesting bees to dig. You can add bee hotels that provide nesting habitat for our renter bees. Um, in addition to the structure, uh, planting broadleaf plants to provide nesting materials for uh, leaf cutter bees is also fantastic. So bee hotels can take any shape and size um, and, the lo and level of complexity. Something as simple as a can filled with reeds is, is great, um, or a huge bee mansion. Your creativity is the limit. Again, any about amount of, of new nesting, nesting places helps. And lastly, be mindful of bees when making landscape management decision. Try to use less or no pesticides or herbicides. Pesticides can be harmful for bees and using herbicides reduces blooming food resources for bees. Mowing your lawn less frequently will provide more food for the bee than as we previously discussed. And think about the landscape that you have access to currently uh, and how that is providing resources, food and water uh, for bees and think about all the ways that you can add any of these resources in to improve your landscape to help them. Do what you can where you can. So in summary, cities are fantastic places for bees. Not only the honeybee, which we all love, but a plethora of other solitary native bees. Soil nesting bee species are the most diverse group of bees living in cities, but stem nesting bees are the most abundant. To encourage more bees to move in, work on adding food, shelter, and water into your surroundings. Leave some soil open and undisturbed or add bee hotels. Re reduce the use of pesticides and herbicides and give weeds a chance. That's all I have today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Your photos are fantastic. Even though I came in being a person who already loved bees, I just am always amazed by their diversity. Um, so we have a couple questions for you if you want to leave your mic on and other people can chip in too. Um, so there's a question from Diane that says if you can provide an example of a broadleaf plant. I think she's referencing um, the for the leaf cutter bees. Oh, right. Um, so I've actually, um, I have some hostas in my yards and, and uh, I actually have damage uh, from or not, I shouldn't say damage. I have um, a bunch of, of like leaf cutter bee holes cut out of that. Um, any, uh, let's see, trying to think of, I should have had a list of this uh, at, the, at the beginning. Um, the circles that they cut are, you know, a couple millimeters in, in diameter. So um, any leaf that has, a, a, or any plant that has a wide leaf, um, you know, sunflower species have good leaves that come to mind. Um, Megan, if you can think of any. Well, I know, I know in my yard, um, we have red buds planted and those are just have all the little circles out of the red buds, which is nice because those also provide food for bees in the early spring. But I mean, a lot of times, and I've even um, have seen them use petals in our horticulture garden, they'll use petals and things like that too. So they'll, they'll use quite a few things. Um, there's another question from Julia that says, can you talk about wasps a little and are they good for the environment? Yeah, so wasps are uh, actually quite quite good. Um, they are also carnivores, so they actually help with a lot of um, like animal product cleanup, um, so like roadkill. Um, they pollinate as well. Um, I don't know quite as much about wasps as I do, but um, they are beneficial uh, insects for, for the environment. I don't know if, if that helped or not. 
Yeah, and, and I know that they also are, they're beneficial in that they're predatory in a lot of cases, so they can help keep the balance of, you know, a lot of the really big pests that can take over. It, it keeps those populations in check. When I first started my job, like very, very first, one of the first things I did was go to a conference at The Ohio State University and heard the messaging of do what you can where you can. And we totally adopted it for everything that we're doing um, because I think it is so absolutely useful. And then when I came to MSU and joined the lab that Kelsey was in, I got to hear her give a version of this talk and then Timothy and Nicole said that they had seen wool carter bees. I was so excited. Um, that we get to, you get to hear what Kelsey has to say on it because they are such interesting bees. Um, yeah, so I, I won't give away too much, so <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, wool carter bees, um, which is um, a type of bee that I studied during grad school, so they have a, a special place in my heart, and they're one that I get a lot of questions about. They're very charismatic, um, and people notice them a lot, um, as, and so we'll go into their behavior a little bit more later, um, and you'll see why. Um, so as Sarah talked about, there's a huge diversity of bees. Um, here in Michigan, we have you know, over 450. Um, there's been a recent paper that documented 465 different species in the state. So we have this huge diversity of bees. Um, I'm of course only going to focus on um, kind of narrow down in group. So Sarah also introduced you to these Megachylidae bees. So these are the stem nesting bees and that you often get in bee hotels. Um, so Osmia, the mason bees that she talked about and Megachylidae, the uh, leaf cutter bees. Um, so these are the two like really common um, species that you get kind of nesting in these bee hotels and these um, cavity nesting species. But you also have within this kind of bigger family group of Megachylidae, uh, you also have the wool carter bees. Um, and these are in the genus Anthidium. And um, here in Michigan, we actually we have two native species, um, but they're pretty rare. So one of them we've only found in Isle Royale, so you're unlikely to find it in Detroit. Um, and the other species um, is pretty rare, um, more common in like southwestern uh, Michigan. Um, you're unlikely to find it near Detroit, though it has been detected in Livingston and Washtenaw counties. So it's possible, but um, relatively rare. Um, but then we do have two exotic species that are very common and very abundant. Um, so those are probably the ones that I'm going to focus on a little bit more. And just, you know, if you want to see pictures, if you think you might be able to ID them, if you see them in your yard, um, again, the rare one, you're unlikely to see it, um, Anthidium um, surreale. Um, so it looks very similar to our um, two exotic species, Anthidium oblongatum and Anthidium manicatum. Um, but just know that you're most likely seeing one of the exotic ones. Um, so you're unlikely to see that, um, that native rare one. In terms of telling those two exotic species apart, that can be pretty tough. Um, so uh, Manicotum is a lot bigger. So that's um, this one on the left. Um, it's bigger than um, Oblongatum on the right, but if you're just seeing one bee out there flying around, that, that can be really tough to tell which one you have. Um, one kind of good giveaway that you have um, Anthidium Manicotum um, is that you see these spikes on the base of the abdomen. I'm going to flip back up. Um, so um, this one's on my hand right here, and you have these five spikes on the base of the abdomen. And we'll go into a little bit more in a minute um, what they use those spikes for, but if you see those, that's a pretty dead giveaway that you've got Anthidium manicotum in your yard. So again, as I said, um, I studied um, Anthidium manicotum, which is the most common um, Anthidium that you're likely to see in your yard. Um, I studied that during grad school, and I was really interested in understanding um, is this exotic bee having any impact on um, our native bees or our native plants? So I'm not going to go too deep into the research that I did, but I'll just give a broad overview of kind of what makes this bee kind of special and why it's a good invader um, and whether or not it's having any impact um, on our, our local ecosystem. So it is native to uh, Europe. So its common name is the, Europe, uh, the European wool carter bee. 
um, but it's now in North America, it's in South America, Asia, New Zealand, so it's really good at getting around. Um, and actually cavity nesting bees in general um, are really good at invading new environments. And we think that's because we likely have um, kind of built environments that we move around um, all around the world that they use for nesting. So we're not quite sure where they're nesting, how they're getting around everywhere, um, but likely they're nesting in like shipping containers or some sort of material that we're then moving all around the world. Um, and that's how they get around and, and spread into new areas. And they get their name, the wool carter, um, because of this behavior that a female does. So similar to the leaf cutter bees, they use plant materials for lining their nest. Um, but wool carters only use plant hairs um, for this. So um, these are called trichomes on plants. Um, as you can see, she's using her mandibles to kind of scrape it off the plant. Um, then she'll ball it up and fly it back to her nest. And it, I guess it kind of looks like carding wool. Um, so that's where they get their name. I always think it's really, it's a really cute behavior. Um, it often looks like she's carrying a little cloud back to her nest. Um, but if you have lamb's ear um, in your garden or nearby, um, this is a really um, common plant for them to use for nesting material. So definitely check that out um, if you have one near you to see if you can spot this behavior. Um, or even just if you go and you kind of can see um, these like bare areas where she's removed um, the trichomes, um, that's a good indication that you have um, wool carter bees in your garden. This is just a um, drawing of kind of what a nest would look like. So again, she's bringing back these, um, these you know, puff balls of, of plant hairs, and that's what she uses to line her nest. Um, and then she brings back pollen and nectar, and that's what she lays an egg onto. Um, that will develop into a larva, and then eventually into a pupa, and then that will turn into an adult bee. And again, these are some pictures, if you could kind of get a snapshot into um, a nest, what that looks like. Um, so she's bringing back all these, all these plant hairs to, to line her nest. But I'm really interested in the behavior of, pause for a minute while I talk, um, behavior of the males um, in particular, because they have this really cool behavior where they actually defend territories. So males will actually set up territories and defend it against any other bees that try to enter. So I'm actually gonna show a quick video um, that goes into that really well. Um, so hopefully the sound works okay. This is a male wool carder bee. And this is his territory. For a few weeks in the middle of summer, he can be found tirelessly patrolling around flowers like this lamb's ear. He will pause only to sleep and drink nectar. Such constant activity requires a lot of fuel, more than the lamb's ear alone can provide. So occasionally he must forage further afield to maintain his energetic lifestyle. This leaves his territory vulnerable, and this honeybee has unknowingly stumbled right into it. Despite being armed with a deadly sting, the honeybee is playing a dangerous game, as the male wool carter is never gone for long. As soon as the wool carter returns to his patrol, he senses something is amiss. In a moment, it's over. With the intruder seen to, he can return to his rounds. So I think that's a really great video for kind of just showing um, what that kind of territorial behavior looks like. And that flight pattern is really distinct for wool carter bees. So if you see that kind of hovering behavior, where they're kind of hovering and moving around, checking things out, um, that's territorial defense um, of a, a male wool carter bee. So, um, really, really obvious when you see it. And just to see a little bit more kind of what those kind of defensive interactions look like, um, I have one more really quick video um, of 
uh, Will Carter be going after a bumblebee on a flower? <laughs> so I'm going to replay that again because it's really good. Um, but yeah, you can kind of see he's kind of turning his abdomen under and kind of jamming it into the bumblebee. Um, and again, I mentioned those spikes on the base of the abdomen. So that's kind of what he's using to go after that bumblebee. Um, so it's pretty, pretty crazy interactions um, when he doesn't want anyone to enter his territory. And I should say he uses the territory um, to attract females. So um, he wants to make sure that the flowers, nobody's touching the nectar there. Um, so then females will be enticed to come visit the flowers, gather pollen and nectar. Um, and that gives him the opportunity um, to mate with her. So um, if he has a really nice looking territory with lots of you know, nectaring plants, um, he's more likely to get a lot of females visiting. And just to um, go into a little bit more about like what makes the wool carter bee so good at invading. So I already talked about um, kind of their movement and their nesting patterns, um, but and they're particularly fond of urban and suburban areas. So especially um, Anthidium manicotum, the European wool carter bee, we don't find this bee much outside of the urban suburban areas, at least at this point. Um, and one of the reasons that we think that is, is that they um, show a pretty strong preference for the European mints. So like things like lavender, catmint, lamb's ear, and these are things that often we're putting into gardens, right? So um, this is a garden that was in um, right off campus um, during grad school for me that was, I frequented a lot um, to help uh, to go look for wool carter bees and collect them. Um, it's got a lot of lamb's ear, lavender, um, so it's, yeah, those are really attractive um, to the European wool carter bee, um, likely because they have these co-evolved relationships um, with these other European plants. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so it's likely the kind of the plants that we're putting into our gardens are what is making it really attractive for them. And again, as I mentioned, it's likely that we're kind of assisting them without even knowing. So it's likely that we're kind of moving their nests around without without realizing it. Um, so I've actually never been able to find one of their kind of wild nests. Um, they, but they go to trap nests really quickly. So, or trap nests are bee hotels um, or reeds that you put up. Um, they tend to use those a lot and they're pretty flexible with what they use for nesting. Uh, there's a really great quote from, it's actually from 1857, um, that female wool carter bees um, have been observed nesting inside the lock of a garden gate um, so they're pretty flexible with what they're using and that likely means they're using kind of um, man-built environments for nesting. This is a common question that I get and one that I think is important. Do they actually cause harm to native bees? And um, my research as well as others has shown that, yes, I mean, they're very good at excluding bees from flowers, right? So um, if we have a lot of wool carter bees around, that means that's fewer floral resources out there uh, for our native bees. And some interactions can lead to severe injury or even death. So um, this is a picture of a fractured uh, wing from a bee that was hit by a wool carter bee. And again, um, I mentioned those spikes on the base of his abdomen. So um, again, he uses those, he'll kind of turn his abdomen under to kind of jab it into the bee that he's going after. Um, so, so not all interactions are kind of that intense and that bad. Um, some of them are really like quick hits. Um, it's not a big deal for the other bee, but, um, but some of them can be pretty severe. However, um, my research as well as the research of others, we haven't really been able to find any long-term consequences for bees. So my research focused on uh, native bumblebee populations. So I used these uh, tents to kind of manipulate interactions between wool carter bees and bumblebees. Um, and I wasn't able to find any long-term consequences for bumblebee populations. So um, we don't think that they're having enough of an impact to kind of have long-term um, population effects. So um, at this stage, I would say, yes, they're probably kind of on the B2B interaction. They're probably having a negative impact um, on bees, but in terms of the kind of greater population of native bees that are in the area, um, I don't think at this stage that they're really of like high concern at this point. But uh, there are things that you can do to try to limit their impact um, on the native ecosystem. And I think number one is to just have a diverse garden with native plants. This is something that we've all been talking about. Um, so if you have native plants, you're more likely to get native bees in your garden, right? Because they have, again, 
they've co-evolved these relationships with native flowers. Um, so yeah, definitely looking to native plants. We have some beautiful ones in Michigan um, that you can plant. Also, if you have a bee hotel and you start seeing um, the exotic wool carter bees starting to use it, it might be better to just take the hotel down. We don't think these hotels really build up um, kind of native populations of bees at any kind of big scale. So, um, so if you have uh, wool carter bees that are using them, um, the exotic wool carter bees, then it might be better to just leave them um, out of your garden um, in that instance. But again, we don't think they're having huge impacts um, on, on the populations of native bees. So I always just encourage people to kind of try to enjoy them, um, spend some time watching them. They are incredibly charismatic. They're really fun to watch. Um, so, so if you have them um, and you've kind of done everything you can to sort of try to discourage them, um, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. And I would just enjoy watching them because they're really fun. And I'm happy to take questions and you can also connect with me on Twitter um, or through my uh, web page as well. Thank you so much, Kelsey. That was yeah. awesome. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. So Anthony would like to know, does the wool carter bee queen mate in the same way as the honey bee? So if you want to talk about the, the mating and the, the social part. Sure. So um, these are actually solitary. Um, so they don't they don't have the same kind of mating as um, honeybees would. So um, female wool carter bees will just go around and kind of look for um, floral resources, and that and then if that happens to be within the territory of a male wool carter bee, the male wool carter bee will then take that opportunity to mate with her, even just while she's like drinking nectar on a flower. So. Um, and so often uh, female wool carter bees are multiply mated by kind of any male that she ends up wandering into his territory. Um, so, um, so yeah, so it's a bit different from honeybees. Um, she's just kind of wandering around, um, not really necessarily looking to mate, just usually looking to gather food and then um, a male will take advantage of the situation. <laughs> Great. Um, so, and then there was a question about, so you talked a lot about the male wood cartage. Do the male and female, um, how they look different? Sure. So females are smaller than males, um, quite, quite a bit smaller. So, I mean, that's somewhat um, not typical um, for insects or bees. So, um, but they are quite smaller. Um, they're usually a lot more timid. Um, so they are kind of usually kind of moving in and out of um, kind of uh, flower areas a lot quicker um, since the males are defending territories they're kind of hanging around and checking things out. Um, females are just there to um, collect resources so they're usually in and out a lot quicker um, so they won't do that hovering behavior that you see um, male wool carter bees do quite as much. Um, so sometimes they can be um, harder to spot um, they otherwise look really similar. This is a, a female that you, that you see here um, so they're you can see they've got these like hairs on the bottom of their abdomen and that's what they use to collect pollen. Um, but otherwise they look quite similar. They don't have those spikes at the base of the abdomen though. Awesome. And then are the exotic, oh wait, so there's a question about the mint family plants. So are all mint family plants non-native such as catmint, in its hip, hyssop, etc.? So I not, I am assuming, do we have some native mints? I'm assuming, yes, we have native mints. Um, yeah, we have a couple, yeah. Yeah, um, but a, most, a lot of the mints that people tend to plant in their gardens tend to be the European ones, um, just because those are kind of heavily cultivated. Um, so those are the ones, they, they're very showy, they're very beautiful and um, good looking. So I don't blame anybody for planting them. I have them in my garden too. Um, but yeah, those are, those do tend to be the ones that um, European wool carter bees really like to visit. And I actually had to Google how many, we actually only have one species. Of you only have one? Oh wow, yeah. what is the one? Mentha canadensis. And I put the link to the, the um, U of M herbarium for it yes. in the chat so we can look at it. That's good. I should know that. <laughs> um, so are the exotic wool carter bees the reason that the natives are so rare or were the natives at risk for another reason? That's a good question. 
That is a good question. So actually, um, we think that the the native wool carter bees, we think that's kind of just how they are typically. So um, the one that we get in Isle Royal, it's a, it's a Western species. So we just get kind of random bees end up also in Isle Royal, but um, low numbers of those is not abnormal. Um, and the same goes for the other um, native species. It's kind of we're on the edge of its range and it's like natural range. So um, so no, we don't think that um, there's any kind of direct competition that's causing causing that. Um, however, if you know wool carter bees continue or exotic wool carter bees continue to increase in abundance, there's possibilities of kind of competition, especially for nesting resources, but um, we don't have any evidence of that yet. Excellent. And then there's one last question on wool carter bees, but if people have other questions too, um, you can feel free to put them in the Q&A. So are the native wool carter bees attracted to the same types of flowers as the European invasive ones? Good question. Um, so we do, so even within the two exotic ones, um, the oblongatum, the other exotic, um, tends to like like the pea family um, plants. So even just within those two exotics, they, they tend to have some differences in what they like. Um, however, I, I should say that both um, kind of all amphidium are relatively broad in what they'll go to. So um, they have you know, preferences for certain types of plants, but um, they are considered kind of um, broad generalists. Um, and I don't know specific plants for the two um, native ones. Um, I've actually, I haven't ever run into either of them um, in Michigan and I do a lot of bee collecting. So um, yeah, that does show how rare they are. Um, and yeah, so I can't think off the top of my head any um, specific plants that those ones are, are attracted to, but I can look that up. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, and I, I do wanna thank Sarah and Timothy and Nicole and Anna for um, joining the panel and for providing lovely information, um, especially in the hot, hot heat. We all had to discuss whether or not you would be able to hear our fans on so that we could provide this to you. Um, and I do wanna thank all of you for your attention too. It's really inspiring and, and great for us when we have people that are willing to take their time out of their evening to learn about bees and other pollinators. Um, that's, we really appreciate that you do that because as you can tell, we all love them and it's nice to be able to share that with you. And I do want to reiterate that it feels like we're at the end of the year, but fall is a great and late summer is a great time to plant trees for bees. It's also a great time to put in perennial plants. So maybe not do the seeds right now, but there's still plenty of season left um, for putting in plants. And like Sarah said, do what you can where you can. If you don't have a place where you can put stuff, I bet Timothy and Nicole can find a place for you to put some trees in and, and other plants too. So um, there, so there is a, a question about beekeeping and um, being famous locations where bees are kept in Detroit. I don't know if there are any famous, I know there's a lot of bees on Belle Isle. I know, I mean, you guys can probably speak a lot more um, where there are bees in the city. Absolutely. Thank you, Anthony, for the question. So is beekeeping legal in Detroit? Well, the city, you have to be in compliance. Um, you just can't put hives um, in any area. They have to be paired with a garden or a pollinator habitat with wildflowers. You have to be paired. It just can't be hives by itself. And famous locations uh, where there's bees, there's actually bees on top of the city, uh, Detroit City Council building which is really interesting. And then you also have, uh, of course, um, bees at the Ford Resource Engagement Center, which is one of our partners' location spots. And also we have hives at Gleaners, but more importantly, one famous location to me is Mumford High School. That's our alma mater. That's where we also have hives there as well. That's great. And I, I just put in the chat for the state regulations. So the city regulations are in there, but the, the state ones. Um, and again, I'll put in, so I put in the Xerxes Society in there. I put in the Detroit Hives in there. I'm adding in the pollinators. And um, so hopefully between all of those, you should find a lot of resources. But um, if you do have questions, you can feel free to reach out through either Detroit Hives or through the Pollinator Initiative. Um, there's another question for you guys. Is there a time frame when the planting starts for Detroit Hives 
And are you guys looking for people who could just dedicate a day or two helping with the projects? Yes, yes. So right now we're in the planning stages. We're we're estimating towards the third or fourth week, fourth week of September to do this planning. We know we're a little late in the season, but due to COVID, a lot of our, our plans have been pushed back. But we're scheduling around the third or fourth week of September. We will uh, be posting flyers and putting out newsletters for those people to attend and be a part of the buzz. Also, we welcome those that are interested to also um, shoot us an email or visit our website at DetroitHighs.org. It's also included in the chat for those that probably didn't get it. And the next question came in from John. Does Detroit High sell nukes? Unfortunately, we do not sell nukes. Um, but our best recommendation is uh, there's a, another local be Well, I'll let you talk about that, Megan. You, I don't know if you sell nukes as well, but I'll let you probably chime in. Um, well, actually, one of the things that we're talking, we had a meeting with the Michigan Beekeepers Association. So we have a state organization, um, Michigan Beekeepers, and you can find out information about them at michiganbees.org, um, which I'll put in when I stop talking. I can't type in chat at the same time. Um, but we had a meeting last night about starting a statewide thing where people who have excess bees can donate their nukes to sell through the um, state club. So you can definitely find them there. Um, there are a lot of local beekeepers who do sell nukes. Uh, quite a few of them are posted on the Northern Bee Network, which is northernbeenetwork.org. Um, but I would say the best thing that you can do is get involved with the local bee club. So SEMBA will have a big list of people. That's the Southeast Michigan Beekeepers Association. Um, and so the Michigan Beekeepers Association is like our statewide umbrella. And then we have lots of little local organizations underneath it. And some is the closest one for the Detroit area. Um, and so there'll definitely be people there getting you set up with um, bees either from Michigan or, or making sure that you can get started with bees in your hives. Okay, I'm gonna add those to the chat. So I do see a, another question from that popped up. What are the rules about having hives in Detroit? Um, once again, um, the one of the you have to be in compliance with the city of Detroit. One one thing that they do ask is that the hives must be paired with a wildflower garden or pollinator habitat. Some type of green space um, has to be the majority of the project, whether it's a wildflower garden, a pollinator habitat, community garden, paired with the hives. It just can't be the highest by itself. Also, another thing is uh, it's always good to have some type of uh, fencing or some type of structure around the hives. This is a little bit added security, whether whether there's a six foot fence or some type of caging structure, just so the bees can have uh, some type of flight where they, uh, a fence to make their flight path uh, fly over six feet instead of anything under six feet. And we do have, so I posted the um, beekeeping rules and regulations link and that has a link in there to the GAMPS which is the generally accepted agricultural management practices and that's the statewide thing through the right to farm act that basically tells you like how to be a good neighbor if you're going to be a beekeeper so it talks about like the fencing it talks about having water out especially in places where there's lots of people around um, you want to make sure that you're keeping bees in a way that's like really respectful for other people, including those people who unfortunately don't like bees. Um, and so making sure that you are being, being nice about it. Um, okay, so I, we're, we're at the eight o'clock. Again, I want to thank everybody for all of your attention um, this evening. We will be recording it and posting it at the um, webinar page for those of you who just want to revisit it or share it with other people. Um, and get out there and plant some plants for bees. All right, thanks everyone, have a great night.